So we're the dynamic duo today. We're going to go a little pit for pat about uh, gaming investments, the landscape, what's really happening, uh, what do real VCs think, uh, how we're behaving, um, and the gaming industry in general. Sounds great. And I will uh, add a bit the entrepreneur's perspective to, to the thoughts of a real VC. Uh, so we're just a quick agenda. We're just going to go through the uh, investments. And then Jan uh, will kind of go through uh, who are the active VCs, what are they investing in, and we'll go back and forth on um, the entrepreneur's perspective and then give you guys some chance to ask uh, questions later. And we want to make this very interactive. Um, kind of uh, my style is to really feed off the audience in terms of the interest of the audience. Uh, but uh, just happy, again, interrupt me anytime. So the key theme for, for me as a venture capitalist, and I've been investing for the last 12 years and have been an investor for 22 years, investing on the private side for 12 years, is that we want businesses that can scale and sustain over time. Um, we see, I see a lot of businesses that are me too. We're just like Zynga, but better. But we're smaller. We just need money to grow bigger. I hear that story day in, day out. And we typically don't, and we've never invested in those kinds of stories. We don't like me too. No me too. That's what it stands for. N -M -N -M -two. A little bit about myself. Uh, this is my profile picture. Uh, we've in, I've invested and we've invested in our firm in Turbine, Xfire, Glue Mobile, Tudo, Wild Tangent, YY, uh, 9U, 7K, 7K. Incidentally, um, you know, we invest in China and the US. We have about a billion and a half dollars under management. Our latest fund is $600 million. We just raised it earlier this year, so we have a fresh pool of capital. And I love gaming. Uh, I spend most of my time with my three gamer kids playing Command and Conquer, Lord of the Rings, Gun Brothers, we skateboard, we snowboard, we are gamers. Um, we also invest in the music business. I also like the music business a lot. So we're investors in Pandora, recently invested in SoundCloud, which is one of the reasons why I'm in Germany, which is another reason why I think the German market is going to be very interesting for venture capitalists, especially US-based venture capitalists, as more successful companies arise in Berlin and more guys like me take that flight from San Francisco to Frankfurt, you're going to see more of us and they'll see more funding. <coughs> which I think is a very important point. So gaming has been a very hot sector. Um, when I started investing in gaming in 2004, VCs hated gaming. They hated it. Oh, it's a hits-driven business. We've never made money. We invested in 30 companies and they've all failed. We'll never do a gaming deal again. All of a sudden, you get a few successes. We did X-Fire, we made 4X in nine months. Turbine, we made 3X in a year, et cetera. All of a sudden, all the other VCs who hated gaming for the last 10 years, hey, gaming space is really hot, maybe we should make investments. And so they made a bunch of investments. Literally hundreds of investments happened in the gaming space since 2005. A handful have worked. And some have worked spectacularly well which is great because it creates an echo chamber in Silicon Valley. Oh, gaming is the best industry ever to invest in. So you get more investments. Lots of three guys and a dog in a garage building a game, and they get VC dollars, five, $10 million. They have no idea what to do with this money, and most of that money has been lost. The gaming sector in aggregate has been a losing business for venture capitalists. Only a very few successes have happened, and they've happened to single companies. So not, not a widespread profit center for, for VCs. I want to give you guys a little bit of reality in terms of how VCs think about the gaming space. Not a lot of successes, but the successes come big because it's a hits-driven business. There's been a, a lot of small acquisitions, and this is actually one of the areas where I'm going to try to push you guys to go. There's been a lot of small acquisitions of good developers building cool games in their mom's basement. These are companies that typically take seed money, borrowed from an uncle or aunt or a couple of angel investors, and they take a couple of hundred thousand dollars and they turn that couple hundred thousand dollars in five million bucks when Zynga acquires them. Those are interesting businesses. I think um, that's where I think the gaming industry started and I think it'll continue to be there and I think there'll be a lot of successes in that five guys, developer team, they build a great game and they just don't have the bandwidth or the know-how to scale. The other interesting thing about the gaming business in the last four years or so, there's been a consolidation of the platforms for gaming. 
you guys all remember what happens with the consoles, right? Consoles were really easy to build on because it was one platform, one set of hardware, one set of graphic, uh, you know, calls that you're going to make to the graphic scripts or languages. It was really easy to develop on. And you had a single easy way to, to sell the product, Walmart or GameStop or the game places. And you have an easy monetization model. You sell a game for 60 bucks. Pretty easy. And gaming flourished from the consumer's perspective and flourished from the developer perspective. Then you got the web and you got all this other stuff coming in, web browsers, downloadable games, Flash. So it kind of, again, diffused a little bit and it was harder to create hits. But over the last three or four years, you had iOS or the iPhone, a single platform, easy to develop on, single distribution point, easy and simple monetization strategies, historically. You had Facebook, which in and of itself was a great platform. Really, it was originally easy to distribute on. It was a great platform. You developed in Flash. Everything was pretty easy. Created a huge industry. Obviously, you got some winners like Zynga, who took advantage of the early distribution mechanisms, which have been shut off, obviously, and got very, very big. And now has been able to sustain that big because of that original uh, bug in the system, if you will. When those platforms kind of came out, they were great for the industry. Now I look at the platforms. You still have iOS and Facebook, which was interesting, but now you have HTML5 and you have the hundreds of flavors of Android. Android is not a single platform. Every device needs customization and porting. So we're gonna go back to the feature phone days. And by the way, HTML5 for all its panacea is gonna to be tough. It's gonna to be really hard. Right now, if you guys think about HTML, just standard, plain old HTML, what's, what, does it work on Internet Explorer? Does it work on Firefox? Does it work on Chrome? Are they consistent across those three platforms today, given that it's been out for how many years now? It hasn't changed. HTML5 is just coming out. Do you think it's gonna perform the same on three browsers, or do you have to do customization again, and it's not gonna work here, it's gonna work there? It's not the panacea that everybody makes it out to be. It's gonna be a very difficult platform. So I think there's going to be a lot of stuff going on in the gaming industry over the next few years. Again, as a number of platforms mushroom, but then they'll consolidate to two or three. They'll make it easy for you guys to make money on. So there's a Ferrari in the last presentation. I like Ferraris. Ferraris are great. They're quick sales, though. You build a company, you get momentum, and you sell it to somebody for a few tens of millions of dollars. Those businesses do not require venture capital money, or at least some big venture capital money. You don't want to raise more than a couple million dollars if you're going to build a game or a single, plat or a single platform company that you know can generate $10, $15 million of revenue, but then it's going to flatten out or, or die because there's nothing after it. Those businesses you want to build up quickly and sell. The other kind of businesses, the sustainable businesses, where you have barriers competitive barriers that you can put up. There's constant course corrections. You gotta build a management team, hundreds of people under your staff. These businesses take time to build. Seven years to build. And everybody says, well, look at Zynga. Well, Zynga won the lottery. Everybody wins the lottery, right? <laughs> Let me go back. Everybody wins the lottery, but it's never you. But because of that guy wins the lottery, how many people go out and buy lottery tickets? Because they see a picture of that couple. It's like, hey, I could be that guy. Don't bet on the lottery. You want to build a sustainable business. Facebook. It's a tough game in social games right now. It's a tough game for venture capitalists in social game. A lot of companies got funded. Very few successes so far. And they change. They change rapidly. I, I looked up the <coughs> presentation of last year when people put up all the best social gaming companies. Put them all up. If you take a look at their MAUs, they're all coming down. They're all trending down. But you know what? There's other guys that are coming up. I mean, I would probably put Kixi up on that list for this year. They're doing really, really well going after the core gamer strategy. But again, the trends is tumultuous. It's really hard to build a sustainable business in social games right now. So I talked about the new frontier, HTML5, Panacina, Android. It's an open platform. They'll let me do anything. Well, there's lots of flavors. I'm on the board of a company that makes mobile games. We support 75 different versions of Android games right now. Thanks a lot of porting. And there's 125 devices coming out this quarter on Android. 
Everybody's going after the core gamer. Well, Zynga's doing the casual, you know, stay-at-home mom. We're going to go after the core gamer, the guy that plays WoW or Lotro or Rift. We're going to go after him and build some great games. A lot of people are doing that. The production value of games, inevitably, as the platforms stabilize like they are, is going to come up. Instead of costing you $50,000 to build a game, it's going to cost you $5 million to build a game that gets the same kind of revenue, the same kind of client. Unless you're really clever and come up with something unique and different. And there's a lot of unique and different out there. Licensed IP. Uh, last two pitches I saw a company where we're going to go back to Time Warner and Disney and license their IP and build great games. We've seen this movie before. This works and it fails. If you've got a successful title, they're going to yank back the IP. If you don't have a successful IP title, you paid too much for it and you're going to lose money. It's a really tough business to do licensed IP. Adver gaming, it's coming back. I mean, we went through this cycle in early 2000. Streaming games, all the Guy Kai's and Otoys and On Lives. You know, there's, all those are coming back. They're all me too's. To me, frankly, th this segment right now is not very interesting. There's some in interesting stuff around these guys, which I think are interesting spaces to invest in. So, new distribution models. This is a plug for my uh, mate up here. You know, you've, there's got to be other ways to distribute your games. Right now, you're tied to the app stores, you're tied to certain websites. There's got to be new ways to distribute. I'm not smart enough to tell you what they are, but you guys are. New monetization strategies. You know, I talked earlier, 98% of the people who play games right now, social games, casual games, don't pay. And they're not being monetized. Figure out a way to monetize those folks. Don't push them away because they actually add value to a lot of games. The guy that's spending $76,000 to build his ship or his base in a very popular Facebook game likes the fact that he's got the biggest and best base. And every, all his buddies that are playing for free see his base and they say, oh, cool base. That's why he spent $76,000. If his friends leave, he's not going to spend $76,000. But there's got to be another way to pay, get those free players to pay or to monetize. Um, how do you deal with the platform proliferation out there? There's a lot of new platforms coming out, right? Um, you know, some argue that the downloadable ba games are going to come back and be in vogue again. The same way that apps are in vogue on the uh, iPhone and iOS, downloadable games back on the PCs and back on Androids and everything else. And HTML will take a, a lesser role. That's interesting. Plumbing, infrastructure, servers, the boring stuff, the really hard science stuff. How do you deal with the big data? Think about all the data that's coming out of games today. What do you do with that data? There's got to be a way to help you make better games and better monetize the games. The whole social layer. Are you going to use Facebook or are you going to use something different? What do people don't like? I mean, they're going to ban Facebook. People don't want to be on Facebook, but they want to play games. How are you going to integrate them? Are you going to use Game Center or are you going to make your own? And there's a whole infrastructure maintenance updating. I just looked at my iOS phone. I've got 76 updates since last week <laughs> on games. I mean, that's not manageable. And finally, an interesting area is gambling. Um, I think it's going to be legal, at least in the U.S. A lot of players coming around and making investments. I think there's going to be a lot of M&A by the casinos. Um, and they're looking for talent. I think there's going to be a lot of micro acquisitions that happen here. Uh, Double Don just got acquired for half a billion dollars. Is that a micro acquisition? No, it's a big <laughs> acquisition. I wish that was a micro. Well, anyways. So that's, that's really my talk. Um, my email address, if you guys need it. And then I'm going to hand the mic over to Jan, and he can tell you about himself a little bit. Yes, thank you. Hani, very much for uh, giving us an overview about the landscape in our gaming investments trend in 2012. And so after now, maybe you got a better impression of, okay, what are VCs looking at in 2012 to invest in? At least I think uh, Hani was very clear on what he would like to fund. Um, I will give a short overview about, okay, what investors should you look for as entrepreneurs? And in the end, uh, the question there is, so what investors do you want to look at in 2012? That's very often the same investors that did a lot of successful and good investment in games in uh, 2011. 
And after that, I will, uh, after we maybe identified some investors, some VCs that could be interesting for you, I will also talk a bit about my experiences. How should you approach the VCs and how should you pick the right one that fits to you and how can you increase your chances to, to really get great VC funding. Um, first, a little uh, background uh, to me. So who I am, uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I enjoy to start new companies, bring them up to a certain level of traction, of solid structure, on, uh, bring them up to a growth path and then after it really becomes a mature business and there are other personalities that are more, uh, more suitable for me than to manage and bring the company maybe from 100 to, to 1,000 employees. So looking back uh, since uh, 2007, I founded four internet startups. The first one was Absolventa. That's a job platform for graduates. It has now 40 employees. Then uh, together with my partners from Team Europe and Internet Incubator, I co-founded in 2008 Madvertise. That's basically a copycat of uh, AdMob, uh, but still uh, very successful, I think, um, based in Berlin and with uh, several other European branches now with 65 employees. Then uh, that uh, time I saw, like, wow, gaming is really hot right now. And uh, we found the model of uh, sponsor pay at that time. And that was in 2009 in April. And I think we saw the model and had been looking around for great business models for maybe two months. And we saw it in an afternoon and in the evening we decided, okay, that's now our focus. We are going to start this company. And yeah, it turned out to be very successful. I'm uh, very happy I founded this company. Uh, now sponsor pay has 110 employees and I was also very active here at, uh, this, at this show. And yeah, that was my entry into the, into the gaming business and in 2010 I went, uh, I went out, took a break, but very, very fast after that I thought, okay, gaming is such a cool industry, I need to come back. And then I came up with the idea of building a game distribution company because I agree with Hani that this is one of the most attractive markets within gaming, especially within online gaming, because you see um, from every $100 a big point or a GameForge or a Mail.ru is, uh, is uh, earning, they will spend maybe something like 50, 60, 70% again in, uh, in uh, distribution. And uh, we are, want to make sure that not all of these dollars go to, go to Google. Um, so uh, besides being an entrepreneur, I've also did some, uh, some investments uh, uh, and I'm very happy with, uh, uh, with the performance of the investments. Um, but yeah, let's move over it and come to the investors you should look at in 2012. And I said, when you want to look at whom should you talk right now, then look at the people that have been successful and committed to gaming in the past because they've the experience, they've the network, and they are also eager to find new gaming investments. So VentureBeat did a nice uh, article, found the source below and listed up all, uh, all gaming uh, investments or all notable gaming investments in uh, 2011. Um, yeah, for those taking picture, I can also send, uh, send the presentation afterwards. Um, so if you look there, Intel Capital is very uh, ahead. Excel is definitely uh, really good in gaming. And then, yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, you can uh, read the list down. It's all very prominent, very big investors. So one thing uh, to, to, to keep in mind, this is now rather the big and uh, international VCs. But for a lot of gaming companies, investment starts with maybe investment from angels, with investment from smaller VCs. And I think the good thing about gaming or also the gaming ecosystem, you can really uh, make a good company out of 1 million euro or at least bring the company with 1 million euro to a state where uh, then other, some of the real VCs can take over and put in 10 or 20 or 30 million to, to scale. Um, besides these VCs, I can uh, personally, uh, from uh, experiences, definitely 
very much recommend uh, to work with Heiko, who is also an investor at Hitfox, but whom I also yeah, knew from SponsorPay and previous experiences. I've also met, uh, made uh, very good experiences with Class, who was an investor in uh, Medvertise, and then also with Gameforge later, a client. And uh, today we were, as Hitfox, also happy to buy a company that before today belonged to uh, Gameforge Class, uh, last company that was add to games, so and I can really recommend him. He has knowledge and he's a good guy to work with. Besides, I can uh, recommend the VCs that uh, I used to work with at Hitfox and SponsorPay, or where I'm still working with. And if you have really good, interesting concept and things, this uh, VCs might suit you. I'm happy to receive presentations, and if I like them, forward them to them. And besides, yeah, I'm also angel investing, but yeah, I have to say at the moment I'm pretty much focused on Hitfox because I think we really have uh, a great market opportunity there. And then not to forget, as another very active gaming investor, Nadi, how could I not mention you here after you said Hitfox <laughs> is an interesting model? <laughs> um, yeah, for a more comprehensive list of game investors, um, feel free to drop me an uh, email. Uh, there we found something in our research. Uh, we are happy to, uh, to share what we found. And um, so maybe you now got an overview or you got the sources who are the game investors you should talk to in 2012. Um, I also, after yeah, having four companies, having founded four companies that are uh, venture capital back, want to give some insights, uh, some short insights and anecdotes on what you should do to approach VCs and what better not to do um, without, uh, yeah, without uh, uh, getting, going too much into detail. So one important thing that you should always take into account is um, not only the VC should screen the company he is investing in. So basically, it's a marriage between two partners and it's going for the very long term. And so if you have the chances to so if you have an attractive company where you are able to attract a lot of VCs, uh, it's great, but you should really also make your own due diligence. And while you do that, not only rely on what they tell you here in the presentation, but really uh, go into detail, meet them in person, ask for references, that's always the best thing. And then you will also learn a lot uh, through their reliability, how fast are they, how much are they into bureaucracy during the negotiation process you have with, with them. Actually, if I can interrupt, don't ask for references. You go on their website, you can see what boards they're on, and call that CEO. Just call the CEO and say, right. I'm doing a reference check on your right. board and your VC, because they're talking to us. Absolutely. And everybody will take that call. Yeah. Don't, but if you get asked for a reference, they'll give you yeah. people that love them already. <laughs> <laughs> People that they gave just gave money to, they're gonna have to say nice things. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Make also the due diligence on the people who give you the reference. Um, yeah. Then uh, during the process, you will uh, you will also learn a lot. And in the end, it's really you better negotiate with some more VCs than you need because in the end, this will just increase your leverage and also. Uh, puts you in a good position to really pick somebody that fits with you and pick somebody that you enjoy to work with over the next years. So then, after you maybe put from the long list a short list of investors you want to approach, then there were several, I would say, obvious do's and don'ts, but as an angel investor, I've very often, uh, I've very often experienced that it maybe is not so obvious as it, as it seems. So um, there were two important rules if you pitch for investments. So basically, it's not like the VC is the giving person and the God. It's like two partners that look if they want to work together. And in the end, you have, hopefully, to bring something attractive to VC. That's the opportunity to, uh, to, to give him a really good return. And he gives something valuable to you. It's a partnership. And that's why uh, pitching and getting to know investors is yeah, somehow similar to dating. So don't appear needy if you talk with VCs. That's obvious, I think. But uh, yeah, sometimes you can really feel that. And that's not, not really helping you. And then 
another very important point is be really precise why you want to work with this investor. So sometimes I got calls uh, on a telephone, which is also definitely not the, the first uh, measure of communication. So you go through an introduction or so you go through an email or you better already know the people, but you never call them first. It's just bullshit. Um, so I get then calls where people tell me, yeah, I've heard you are investing in startups and that's why I want to work with you. So this is totally unattractive for the investor. So if you translate that to the world of dating, you wouldn't ask a girl for you to go out with you if you say, hmm, you are, you are a woman, that's why I would like to go out with you. Doesn't make sense. So there were only two good reasons. There were only two good reasons why you would like to work with an investor. Ah, so that's why it didn't work. <laughs> True. So there are only, in my opinion, there are only on an abstract level two reasons. So the one, the one reason is um, the specific money do they have, all, all of them have money, so that's a commodity. Some of them have more, some less, and you have to, to, to make the selection that they fit with your investment need in the beginning. But in the end, uh, it's only after you've done that, it's only about, okay, what specific value has the investor to add to your business? So. If you don't know them before, you must really, in the first contact, have done your research and really approach them. And I could approach Nadia and say, hey, let's talk because you like game distribution companies and I liked what you talked here. That would be a way to get, to get in contact, I think. It, what, uh, the average time for GGV uh, that we have known a CEO before we've invested is about 11 months. Uh, I've known Alex Lung from SoundCloud for almost a year and a half. Before we actually made the investment. So starting a relationship early with the VCs helps. And just you know, calling and saying, hey, uh, you, know, you know a lot about the gaming space. I know you're the board of XYZ company. Uh, I'm thinking of starting a company that's a little like this. Uh, here's my idea. Uh, do you have any plans or advice or thoughts? I, I would take that call. Um, I would take that call as an initial call just to get to know a potential entrepreneur that I may invest in. Uh, but then, you know, Six months later, you should give me another call. Here, uh, we started the company. Here's the stuff that's going on. What do you think? Hey, I raised a little bit of angel money from my uncle. Uh, I might need the money you know, six months from now. Uh, and just kind of keeping up to date and keeping that person involved in the company's life cycle will help you when you're asking for that big check from the venture capitalist. Ab absolutely, because that way, the venture capitalist will not have the impression for example, if you say, hmm, I want to talk with you because you're an investor, then he thinks like, hmm, probably I'm the 3,000 VC he's talking with. That's why he comes up to me without any specific reason why he wants to work with me. So uh, basically, be specific, choose maybe five to 10 investors where you think there is a great fit, and then show them also you've done your research, it would be a good fit, uh, that's very important. And then there is one other reason besides just, uh, besides just uh, specific knowledge the investor can have. That's uh, if you already have a previous relation with the investor and now, okay, maybe he's not exactly my industry fit, but he's a very smart person. He's tri he, he enjoys my trust. We have a good relation we would like to work with. That's also, of course, a very good reason to choose a VC. And if you come and say, I'm not raising any money right now, but here's for the next six months, these are the milestones that I'm gonna make, and then I'm gonna need money at the end of the year, and you come back in six months and say, hey, I did all those things I told you I was gonna do, I did, and now I'm raising $10 million or $5 million. You've got the respect of the VC, and you're probably well on your way of getting funded, versus if you just go cold and say, hey, I did all these things six months ago, and the last six months, I'm not gonna have a basis to say whether or not you beat or met your expectations, where have you been? So having that relationship really matters. Right. So in the end, it comes to this two specific reasons. So the best thing uh, definitely is get to know your potential investors early. The very best thing is having already some kind of shared work experience. So for example, um, two or three of the investors at SponsorPay uh, that I already worked with were very eager in the end to invest in Hitfox. And that was a much faster process 
So that's in the end the best thing. But even if you haven't worked with them, if you know them for several months or a year, send them stuff in between, they get a good feeling of who you are. And in the end, in that matters, you also get a good feeling of who they are. And in the end, it's like a partnership. And yes, yeah, so I hope uh, what uh, Hani and I presented here will help you a bit to raise funding in 2012 or if you're interested in that in 2013, and if you're looking for 2013, then it would maybe be a good idea to connect now with Nadi and uh, tell him about uh, the plans that you have. Thank you very much for your attention. A beer for the first person to ask the question. <laughs> I think she got you. Come on. <laughs> uh, Anke, I'm an entrepreneur uh, in the gaming industry. I'm sorry I was a little bit late for the uh, for the talk, but uh, I, I have a question because uh, I've been raising capital for the past year and a half or almost two years now. have been able to realize also some of this capital. But um, what I notice as a startup, what is really difficult is that if you have a kind of idea and you work really with low budgets to kind of realize it because you're ambitious and you have a goal that you want to reach, uh, that why uh, investors are like there's only like w what I noticed is you have the kind of uh, investor that wants to uh, invest in startups and they have like 50,000 or like the angel investors uh, you have them but there's a really big gap between like the angel investor and then the next step because it's then you know you have to make your business plan up to a million or higher uh, and there's not really something in between. And my question is, why is that? Or do, do you have an answer for that? And, and, or do you even notice the same? So <laughs> that, that, is exactly, that is exactly right. Um, there is a gap between angel investing, and angel investors and what I call the B round, uh, or even the C round, the growth investors. Um, a lot of venture capitalists have gotten so big in the last five, six years Instead of having a $300 million fund, they now have a billion dollar fund. And it makes it very difficult for them to invest $5 million into your A round. So there's been a lot of movement in the venture capital community from just the pure and simple A rounds to much later in, in the process. At the same time, you know, if you take a look at the statistics on the A rounds, the A round size has gotten bigger over the last probably four or five years again because of the size issue. So the typical A round when I started in the venture community was three million bucks, two to three million dollars. Now it's probably closer to six or seven million dollars, the average A round. And so to put that kind of money, uh, you're gonna have to eliminate a lot of the risk for the story because they're not gonna write a, write a big check until the risk is eliminated. So what I would suggest in that situation is that the second you raise your $50,000 seed capital, you start talking to institutional investors, VCs, saying, I just raised my angel money, this gives me a good six to nine months to run to build my product. I'm, this is what my product's gonna look like. These are my milestones, and here are the biz dev deals and the partnership I'm gonna get over the next six months. And you go visit them every three months, say, hey, this is what I've accomplished. And that will, let, in their mind, that will eliminate a lot of the risk in the A round, and you'll likely, more likely to get some capital. Um, that's, that's, I think, the best way to, to approach it. Um, this, at the same time, um, you, got, I think you just got to re reduce your risk profile somehow in the A round because to, to get these big checks, you're going to have to reduce the A round. And the industry will self-correct. Um, the, difficulty with, the difficulty with that is that if you come to an investor, I've noticed that now quite a lot of times. When you come and you say, okay, I need like 200,000 or 300,000, you know, to make the final proof of concept. We can do this and this and this for this. We can prove everything. We're in some kind of way not interesting enough because we are not raising 10 million. Right. And I, I find that, well, I hear this a lot and maybe I, I'm searching in the wrong places, but I'm just wondering why th this is. Because for me, it would also be logical if a big partner that has like a lot of experience and you, uh, you know, accomplish all the steps that you uh, say up front, 
that this would be a, a far more logical approach than you know just coming at the end and say hey I need this but I, I'm just you know in the it, broker I, <laughs> I think the, the point is why uh, there are a lot of seed investments and why then the investments come in late is the reason at the seed investment round the valuation is so low so you can really afford that uh, a bigger rate of your investments doesn't work out or on the other side also that maybe if the valuation is only 500,000 in the seed round then it's a great return if the company comes back with uh, 10 million from a zinger and it was a small company so from my perspective also as an angel investor it's attractive if I believe in the team and the market to really invest very early when it's really early stage but the valuation is low and then I can invest just based on the market and the team and I would guess they will figure it out how it works and that's cool but then on the other side um, the other interesting thing is to come maybe in the very later round and to say when okay when everything of the business model is proven and the VC can really have his analysts squeezing the numbers ten different ways and it's all the time it's coming more money out if they throw money in then it's also an attractive situation to invest because the risk is really low even so the return is maybe not that high at the moment but the problem is in the A round it's often like okay the company is looking cool there's a lot of more things in place there's a lot of more people working there you get some uh, great uh, you get some great press coverage and all the nice stuff but the risk hasn't really gone away it's just looking better and that's in the end for an investor maybe not so attractive to to take the risk but to have not the really high upside anymore and that's maybe the, the, the problem there and I think where, where is your company located? In the Netherlands. Ah, okay so for example in Germany we have then some some institutions like the high tech Gründerfonds and stuff like that to, which exactly comes in the middle and can be a good uh, yeah a good, good source of capital for those investment where uh, just purely ROI focused private VC would maybe not take it but they take it and oftentimes it works out but maybe you have similar programs and on the other side maybe I would just say sometimes also it's just about okay being half a year more in business mm -hmm. on a smaller scale brings you to that point where you can really prove the concept and then you are up for the bigger round and haven't diluted so much before maybe that's also the solution but if you feel like that from 30 VC meetings you don't get positive feedback then it's rather unlikely to go the same way so you should change change something yeah. um, that, to that point you should change something um, when you when it's that early of an investment you're betting on two things you're betting on the pitch or the idea and the CEO that's it if both those things are not good you're not gonna get funding and so if you're not if they're not resonating with your audience uh, change one or both Second question? Hey, it's Sebastian. Um, so I'm an entrepreneur, uh, started my own company just now, and building my first game. So uh, you just answered some of the questions that I actually had, but um, building on that from just now, proof of concept, how would you define that in a game? Do you need to see players playing it, players monetizing, user acquisition costs, do you need to see revenues? Is that your proof of concept? Is that your seed round? I, w I, w I would definitely or say... What you come in before? I, w I would, I would uh, uh, definitely say so if you can see and if you can prove, hey, if we invest one dollar more in marketing, we will get a return of three more dollars just based on the user lifetime value and the virality and some other very proven. Then it's kind of a proof of concept, but in the, in the gaming industry, a proof of concept then only lasts for maybe a year because it's not maybe not a sustainable competitive advantage. But even that for a year proof of concept for your game now until not 10 competitors say, hey, we are copying the game and maybe putting in even more money, which then just destroys the ROI. You have a temporary ROI and typically from what we've seen, then it's possible to raise money even if it's not from uh, Hanna. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so for every investor, and then every firm, it's going to be a different um, situation. Uh, for me, 
Um, for me, there's, there's two parts to the answer. For me, I want to play the game. I'm a gamer, I understand games. If I am sucked into the game and I play it for three hours, uh, you're, you've impressed me. Now, step two is what's the size of investment and what's the risk profile of the company? How easily copyable is the game? And all, there's a whole bunch of things that, you know, barriers to entry. Going back to my sustainable, the old Mercedes that did up a million miles, I want something that's sustainable and scalable and defensible. So that comes after the fact I like the game. Uh, and so it, it, that's, that's probably the quick answer is that there's, there's, depending on the investor, there's certain things they look at. Some VCs, I won't <laughs> invest in a single game company. Just won't do it. Just won't do it. Um, we've, we've not invested in a single game company. We invested in a company that had three games. Uh, that was Turbine. They had Lord of the Rings Online, Dungeons and & Dragons, and Ash Runs Call when we invested and they were building two more games. So I was able to look at the track record of those three games, see how they developed them, the fact that they had the same developers, the same team there, and how, they, the, how, the, how those monetized over time. So it was very easy for me to build a model saying, hey, this is, this is gonna be a good investment. So you really have to make sure you understand your audience. Sure. So in your seed round, um Like, I would need money for marketing, right? So I would need a seed run for that. So um, I would like to move fast on the marketing. So I'd like to enter the market quickly in loads of fronts, be cross-platform. So if I need a big marketing budget right up front, but the VC would like to see the game progression first, then I have a problem with competitors maybe being able to copy the game, etc. cetera. It, it's true, but I mean, there is an economic sense in it. So if if you haven't proved the game, and just think about it, you, you want to go fast, just think about a car. So if you haven't proved the car, you wouldn't drive 300 kilometers per hour. So you better start slow, see it works, and then scale it up, else uh, it's likely that, you, the likely that you burned money. Except you have a track record of five other companies before worked, then they will just give it to you and say drive. There's some really neat tricks that a lot of people use to, to do that. So releasing a game in, in the US, they release it in Canada, only in Canada. And then they look at the user metrics very closely. You know, uh, engagement rates, however you want to measure them, whether the, how, how many times a day they play, how often they come back, the percentage that comes back, the tail off of playing, all those things then will come back and say, okay, this is going to be a hit game because look at my metrics. They're all up and to the right. I need to bring it into the rest of the world and pour some marketing dollars on it. That might be a better pitch than saying, here's a game, I haven't released it yet because I'm afraid of my competitors, but I want to pour the gas on from day one. Having some data before when you go out and get that seed round will really help your efforts. And whether it's a small market or a small sample set, maybe that's, that's the way you do it. Questions? Hi, my name is Thomas. I, I come from a startup in, based in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, my question is, uh, do you need to have a US presence in order to attract uh, American VCs to invest in you? Or um, is it that just a myth? Um, it depends on the VCs. There are some VCs that were I've been literally quoted saying, I won't invest in anything that I can't drive to. Um, there's a lot of those in Silicon Valley. There's a, there's a lot of ego in venture capitalists. They're, they think they, you know, whatever. It's worse than surgeons. Um, so there's some VCs that just won't do that. Uh, uh, the, the, the way that we work as a firm is that every partner is very vertically focused. They have centers of gravity. So I focus on gaming and digital media and music, right? Uh, SoundCloud is based in Berlin. They've started an effort in San Francisco, but frankly, that didn't matter to me. The fact that it was a company that had 10 million uniques a month, growing their library quickly, um, got an attractive valuation. I had known Alex for a long time, made it a simple investment, not afraid to travel. We made our first investment in China. So half our business is in China. We made our first investment in China in 2001. People thought we were crazy back then. That was Alibaba. We invested in Alibaba at a very low valuation. It's now worth $35 billion. So we're not afraid to take a flight to find the best companies. And those are the fees, VCs you should try to uh, go after. People that understand the vertical market are less likely 
to say no because you're based somewhere else. Frankly, that's an excuse because they don't like your business model. I got a second question as well. Uh, right now we are backed by a business angel investment and uh, I was wondering what, what's a common uh, process of a VC entering in terms of uh, uh, the business angel's uh, interests? Do you buy them out or what, what's, what's a common process when a big VC uh, enters in, in a year round? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Oh, what, what, what do you do uh, as a new money coming into the company? What do you do? Do you buy out previous investors? Normally, uh, that's rather seldom the case. So typically, uh, uh, in, a, in a good case, uh, you will have a case where you keep your old investors, they continue <coughs> investing in you, that shows the community, hey, there is trust from the people that know the company, and then maybe you add one to other VCs that add something to your company that you haven't had before, and then you have maybe a, ni a mix of old investors and new investors, and it's only occasionally that in the funding rounds, uh, VCs buy out the previous VCs. Even so, that can happen, but that's not the standard case. Maybe five, ten percent, or maybe they buy a small stake out. But in the standard, the old VCs stay in, probably pa participate if it's going well, and then somebody new else comes in. If it's an early stage company and the old, the existing VCs want to sell out, that would scare the shit out of me. Um, <laughs> What does he know that I don't know, right? That's, that's the thing. You don't want your existing investors to sell. Um, even if the company is doing 50 or $100 million in revenue, because that's a red flag. That's going to make me do extra work. Uh, it does happen. You know, now other companies, you know, Zynga had a ton of secondary, Facebook, there's a lot of that. But even then, I, I get nervous when the guys that know the company the best want to sell. Thank you. My name is um, Gary, and I'm working largely in the um, for the financing sector of, of the media industry. And um, Jan, you just um, touched upon the question that I would have asked, and you half answered already, is that I'm used um, if if I think about financing a product in this um, uh, in this kind of game, I would start packaging my financing. I would look um, for equity investors. I would look for public funding. I would look for minimum guarantee, maybe from a publisher. I would be looking for a bank to cash flow the money that maybe comes in too late for me to um, to produce my product. Um, it sounded a bit like that this packaging is fine in some way, but a VC would rather see that he either does the whole thing or otherwise it gets too complicated. Is that true? Mm. In uh, most of the transactions I see in really startups that really go for growth, that want to grow big, it's, it's really normal that there is, at least in the, in the early rounds until maybe it's VC, it's only in the end venture capital that goes in and there is no bank no other company involved because they just can't keep up with the processes and they are also not the right institutions to judge the risk which is in there. So it wouldn't just work from the institutions there and I think uh, that's the reason why you typically see uh, within startups then only VCs investing except maybe for the later stage where there comes a VC that gives a convertible loan that has some equity kicker or stuff or uh, that's just that's just what what I what think I the, see. the simple answer is the more complicated, the harder it is, the less va the lower valuation is going to be. On the other side, from the entrepreneur's perspective, if you can instead of uh, taking VC money, yeah. have an easy process to to get bank money or to get a loan where you don't have to to uh, to to uh, deal with us. Yeah, uh, right, right. So deal with us or deal with the dilution. Yeah. coming in from the VC. I mean, you, you like to deal to, with uh, good VCs because they really add value. On the other side, they put an interest rate in their mind of maybe 50%, 100% on the money. And so if you can really afford to get loans, that's a great opportunity. So uh, take, uh, take cheap money if it's not really costing you too much in terms of bureaucracy and stuff. But typically, that's just not the case. And typically, you also don't want to really spend like six months filling forms and you want a VC that's able to move in the same speed uh, that you are moving as a startup. Thanks, most interesting.
this one backhand. Thanks. Yes, hi. Um, my name is Ola. I, uh, I'm a co-founder of a startup moving into a more organized state of operations. Uh, and we've been talking to VCs on and off, uh, and I've attended a lot of these types of seminars around VC. And what do you think of VCs capital. so far? <laughs> oh, we don't have any VC investment. But what do you think of VCs so far? Highly interesting. Uh, I have to say, <laughs> but my question is, I mean, I see a bit of a catch-22 here, because it seems that to really get VC funding, you need to find a bunch of VCs, spend time with them, get to know them on a personal level, uh, expose them to your character and your you know, pros and cons and your product. Whereas VCs are pressed for time, they have lots of money, they're high status, everybody wants to talk to them. It's very hard to get um, you know, a word in edgewise and, and even more so to sit down and have a cup of coffee regularly with them, it seems to me. Uh, you got, guys got any practical tips on, on how to get to spend more time with VCs in a non-threatening environment? Uh, I have, let me I, take... Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, 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 for example, have one. Um, so in the end, every meeting you have is an exchange. So you must provide something valuable to the VCs. Yeah. That could be a great investment opportunity, or maybe you're just the funniest guy on earth that could also sometimes help, but not too much, maybe. And then there is another strategy um, that I used when I uh, dropped or when, when I finished my university and did some some other party ventures there and then I thought like okay what can I do to to get the right to what what's a strategic move to start with something serious in the internet and get all the attention from VCs that I want and from other people that I want and there was I did a strategic move and became besides my studies uh, uh, author of Gründerszene.de, which is a leading German entrepreneurship magazine. And by that way, running around with a camera, interviewing VCs, they were so happy to talk with me. And I got to know them. And while I got to know them, I could throw in some smart sentences. And they said, like, hmm, he's young, but maybe he can do something. And that was, a, in the end, for me, a good, a great entry, a very good investment. I invested maybe 10 months on a voluntary base, 20 hours. And after it, I was there. And I had the network standing, and people were happy then to go out with me for coffee. And it, it's, I mean, like, it's, it's exact. I mean, he, I think his analogy of, I mean, this guy is brilliant, and by the way, the, this, is, this works. It's like dating. Give me a reason why I want to be with you, right? Get to, you, know, you understand your business and your market way better than I do. There are companies in my portfolio that touch on your business. If you're telling me stuff about my own portfolio companies or my competitors' portfolio companies, I'm going to listen. I'm going to lean in. If you're just talking to me how great your business are, is and how great you are all the time, you know what? I'm going to go have a beer. Thank you, the both of you. I mean, yours is an anecdotal example, but I, I really see the line of thinking. I mean, write a blog, uh, contribute as, an, as a report of some kind, or just provide expose value. yourself provide in discussion value. groups. Provide value to them. Yeah. Uh, I, value. I mean, thank as you. Well. Very helpful. Thank you. Uh, who needs the mic? Hi, I'm Espion. Um, talking to the gentleman over there, are talking further on, on that subject, and also actually the first question about the bridge funding or from the initial um, uh, angel investment to a VC round. So concretely, um, right now, uh, I have a slate of free games I want to do. They are building on the same technology. And um, I'm also talking to publishers on these projects um, and, and seeing interest. And it's not unlikely that they could fund one of these projects. So my question is, um, how, does that, how do that put me in terms of raising uh, a round later on? Because obviously, I'm going to give up either part of my revenue stream, uh, one of my IPs, you know, or something like that. And um, how would that put me? Yeah, basically, um, for in the eyes of the VC. What are you trying to build? What do you want to build? So um, we are, um, this is my second uh, company. I did a mobile company first, uh, a mobile gaming company. And now we're building a, a location-based social gaming company, uh, yeah, obviously focused on mobile. Yeah, and so your question again? What do you want to build? So, well, basic location-based games. Okay. So we're building a, yeah. yeah. What's the common theme among the games? 
Um, well, the come theme. What, what, I mean, what, what do you mean? Yeah, you location based in mobile, or like the yeah, I guess you could. Yeah. Are you building restaurant finders? Are you building uh, fun games where I can kill my friends? Are you building yeah, casual yeah, it's, games it's, it's, where I can it's, find? It's a location aware uh, gameplay that serves experiences to the player based on where you are located and and what your friends are doing, basically. All right, so real-time feedback here. I, I don't know the products, I don't know you very well, but uh, just by simply asking, what are you trying to build, and, you, and the response was, I'm building a game or games, location-based games, I didn't get a real sense that there is a plan for a very large company. Um, what I got a sense is I'm, I'm trying to make some money uh, by building some games and selling them, and selling them to people. And so from that perspective, if you're going to take, so look, if you're going to take anything more than a half a million dollars from investors, you're committing that you're going to build a company that's going to be worth at least a hundred million dollars, right? If you're talking to guys like me, what you're saying is I'm building a company that's going to be worth more than a than hundred million dollars. Because, you know, I write three, four, five million dollar checks and I want to see five X return on those checks and you work the math backwards. So it's got to be at least a hundred million dollar exit for me to care, mm -hmm. right? To, or for me to invest, I'm signing, I'm signing Callus, because we all are, by the way. Um, so if your goal is to build a $100 million company, you've got to have a much clearer picture of what you're trying to build. And if you have a clear picture of what, what you're trying to build, um, there's m many ways you can get there in terms of getting your first step. So if you want to do a publishing deal with somebody to prove out that you can build games because you cannot get funding, because people don't believe you can build a game, that's what you have to do. But if you can prove to me and other VCs that you can build games based on your previous experience as CEO of another of the other st startup or whatever you did at the other startup, and the traits and the characteristics of the games you're building are very similar, then I think it should be fairly straightforward for you to raise an A round without having to give up your IP or technology or publishing rights to somebody else. But if you're just building a game and you want to keep it in a, we call it in the US a lifestyle business, where you want to sell it for five or 10 million bucks, get, the, get, get any funding you can for however you can, because it's, mu it's far easier to build a company and sell it for five or $10 million than to build a $100 million company. Am I making sense? I kind of talked a lot oh, there. No, it, it makes perfect sense and also makes me more certain that I shouldn't go for a publishing deal. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Courage. Actually, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, if you have more questions uh, to our speakers, you can ask uh, personally on the uh, general interest, interest mingle, which is start now in the hall ne uh, near in foyer near hall one. So there will be beer, wine, and a lot of networking. And thanks our speakers for the great session. Thanks, guys.